Now, chapter 58, as you may know, has a link with chapter 59, and the link really is in the problem of unanswered prayer. Did you notice that in chapter 59, at the very beginning, we have this assurance from Isaiah that the reason that they are not having prayer answered is not that God's arm is too short to do what they ask, or that his ear is too deaf to hear what they are saying. It is a different reason altogether. Now, in chapter 58, do you remember at verse 3, for example, they have pled with God and asked him, Why have we fasted, they said, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? That is, there has been no response from God. And God says at the end of verse 4, You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Now, last time we explored something of this false fasting which the people of Israel had engaged in. That was a fasting which involved them in denying themselves things, but not denying themselves. And there is a great difference between the two. Now, they thought that by fasting in the sense of denying themselves things, the way people deny themselves things at Lent, for example, that they would be impressing God. And God says it is not denying yourself things, it is denying self that is the essence of true fasting. But they thought they would be heard. Now in verse 9, God begins to tell them what is the key to answered prayer. Notice what it is in verse 9 at the beginning. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer you. When is that? Well, it is when in verse 8, your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. It is when there is a moral transformation in their lives. Answered prayer appears to be closely associated with moral issues. Now, notice how in the beginning of chapter 59... Isaiah, in what is probably another sermon, clarifies the real reason for God's unwillingness to hear. And you notice what he says. He does it first negatively and then positively. Negatively, it is not due to any deficiency in God. He is neither disabled nor deaf. That's what verse 1 is saying. Surely, truly, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Now you get the picture. It is not true that God hears your prayer and stretches out his arm to touch you in blessing and finds his arm is too short to reach you. This is not the problem. It's not that God is disabled to do what you are asking him, nor is it true that God is deaf and doesn't hear what you're saying, nor is his ear too dull to hear. So negatively, there is neither disablement nor deafness in God, although that appears to be what they presume. They presumed that when they prayed, and of course they did it within the context of this idea of fasting being just an outward performance, they thought, when we pray, God is bound to do what we ask him to do, if he hears or if he is able to do it. And the question they were asking is, is God suffering from a shortened arm that he cannot reach far enough to bless us? 
Or is he suffering from a deaf ear that he doesn't hear what we are saying to us? So Isaiah brings them the real answer positively in verse 2. He says, Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now, do you notice how Isaiah changes the pronouns? The pronouns that they have been concerned with have been he and him and his. But the pronouns Isaiah is concerned with are you and yours. It is your iniquities have separated you from your God. Indeed, you can divide up the whole of this 59th chapter in Isaiah by the pronouns. Verses 2 to 3, you just look, it's very obvious once you look at it. Verses 2 to 3 are addressed to you and yours, your sins, your hands, your fingers, your lips, your tongue, and so on. Verses 4 to 8 are taken up with the pronouns them, they, and their. Verse 4, for example... They rely on empty arguments. They conceive trouble. They hatch the eggs of vipers. Verse 6, their cobwebs are useless for clothing, and so on. And that goes on through to verse 8. Verses 9 to 15 concentrate on the pronouns us and ours. Notice verse 9. So justice is far from us, and the pronouns all change. And righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. Verse 10, like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. At midday, we stumble. That goes right on to verse 15. And then, from verse 16, indeed from verse 15, the second half of the verse, the pronouns change again, and they become him. And his, the Lord looked and was displeased, there was no justice. He saw there was no one. He was appalled there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him. So there are really these four sections in the chapter, concentrating on you and yours and you, concentrating in verses 4 to 8 on they and them and theirs, concentrating in verses 9 to 15 on us and ours, and then from verse 16 on on him and his. And you can see easily how the movement of the chapter, therefore, is directed. Let's look at the first of these in verses 2 and 3. Because God is here addressing uh, the people through the prophet about the reason for unanswered prayer. You'll notice that it is described in three ways. The reason for unanswered prayer is that sin or iniquity has distanced or divided them from God. One of the basic things that sin always does is to divide or to separate or to distance whether you're talking about its effect between people or between people and God. Sin always distances people. You know how this is in the very simplest, most elemental uh, form of it. If you have an argument with somebody or a disagreement or a good going fight, you know what happens. You're distanced from them. It happens in a domestic situation. You have some disagreement. You find that you lose your temper. Now, what happens when you sit down at the table after that? Hmm? Well, what happens is, of course, that uh, conversation gets stilted. And uh, situations become more embarrassing. And it's very difficult to continue a normal relationship, isn't it? And you say, look, we need to stop this nonsense. We need to repent of our sin and get right with each other. 
Now, precisely the same thing happens between every man and woman and God when sin has entered into our lives in this way. Your sin, he says, separates between you and God, and it does. It distances you. It divides you. What on earth would we expect that it would do when it does this between ourselves? Surely we recognize that it does the same with God. And so I come into God's presence, and if I've got a degree of honesty, and there is sin harbored in my heart, at the very least I'm embarrassed. Aren't you? And sin separates us in that sense from God. Your iniquities have separated you from God. Now you notice the second thing, it doesn't just distance us from God, it denies us access to Him. So he says, your iniquities have separated you from God, your sins have hidden His face from you. Now, there's the next problem, you see. There is an averted face of God turned away from us in our sin. You cannot just uh, glide into the presence of God, having disobeyed and grieved Him, and find that God is turning His face towards you in grace. Harbored sin, unrepented and unconfessed sin. Now, that's a big qualification. It's really important to grasp it. It does not mean that I have, if I have failed and fallen, I may not come into the presence of God. We'll be discovering what Isaiah says about that at the end of the chapter. But harbored, rep- unrepented, unconfessed sin, undoubtedly denies me access to God in the sense that his face is turned from me. And it disinclines him to hear. You notice what Isaiah says. Your sins have hidden his face from you. So the felt presence of God is something that sin makes us far feet and he will not hear. So the problem is not deafness. It's not that God cannot hear. It is that God chooses not to hear. Now, there's an important distinction. Let's just read verse 2 again, because we really do need to take the Word of God seriously and ask questions about why We are not really getting through to God in prayer. Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now, that, of course, is why Jesus says to um, his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, you remember, if you've got something against your brother harbored in your heart, that is, if you're harboring sin against somebody else and you're going to the temple to make an offering, Jesus says, let me give you a bit of advice. You go and see your brother and put things right with your brother first of all and then go to God. Why is that? It's not because of some liturgical rule. It's because when you go to God with unconfessed, unrepented sin, you will discover that he's disinclined to hear. So there is neither disability nor deafness in God. It is that he will not hear. So instead of God's arm or ears being the problem, notice in verse 3, it is your hands your fingers, your lips, your tongue. Your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wicked things. Now, that simply means that I need to have my guilt and the stain of my sin dealt with. I need to confess my lies and the malicious words of my tongue to God. 
and then my fellowship with him will be right. He then sets about a major exposure of the serious effects of sin, but you'll notice the most serious of them is first, and that is the averted face of God. Now, from verse 4 to 8, you have a description of the effects of sin and godlessness on society. And uh, this is the second group of verses, a they and them passage. You'll notice how the pronouns change. It is a general exposure of what is wrong with society once this kind of thing begins to spread within a nation. And you'll notice there are certain primary casualties of godlessness in society. You notice what they are. They are first justice, and then integrity, and then truth. Notice in verse 4, no one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments and speak lies. Notice how that's developed in verse 14, just for a moment, because this is where the casualties of godlessness in a society are found. And he pictures a kind of town square like George Square where he says justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets and fallen. Honesty is not even allowed to enter. Now you see the picture. Truth fallen in the streets as a casualty of godlessness. Justice pushed back to the borders of the town square. Righteousness standing at a distance. And honesty not even allowed to enter. Now, this is a picture of the corruption of society which godlessness produces at an official and national level level. But it begins at a personal level and spreads out into every area of life. Someone was telling me just the other day that they had been speaking to the permanent secretary in the home office. And he had been alarmed and disturbed at the astonishing increase in dishonesty and a lack of integrity throughout the whole of society. It arose, I think, because of a conversation about the need that so many companies had to write into their expenses an allowance for pilfering. And the allowance for pilfering in the average reasonable-sized company goes into five figures. And he was saying, you know, the problem about that, of course, is that it affects the whole of the economy. It's not just a moral issue, he said. It affects the whole of the economy. And my friend thought this is the reason that uh, it was becoming of interest to him. It was an economical issue, you see, not just a moral one. Because, he said, these goods cost more because you have to put into every consideration the amount that pilfering costs. Then you've got to add an amount for shoplifting, which is never recovered, generally speaking. And when you've done that, you discover that there is a substantial element in costs that's down to dishonesty. A very significant thing. I remember thinking how remarkable this was when I was with David Ellis in Indonesia. You get this 
and the scale that it is in our country today, and people are shocked at it, of course, when you get some major dishonesty or lack of integrity, everybody is very surprised. I remember an occasion in Indonesia when David Ellis went to the equivalent of the Inland Revenue, and he was there to talk to them about the tax on a car which he had. And uh, when he went into the office, the tax man, who was a senior official, said to him, uh, well, the tax will be something in the region of... Uh, 850 pounds, let's say. And David said to him, well, now, I'm not a Western businessman. I'm a missionary, and I don't have 850 pounds. And he said, oh, this is the Inland Revenue. How much can you afford to pay? Quite serious. This was a, an ordinary discussion with Javanese tea. And he said, uh, well... Uh, he said, how much do I need to pay? How much can you afford to pay, he said. And he realized the man was starting bargaining with him. And they got down to a figure of somewhere around 150 pounds. That's all right then, he said, uh, 150 pounds. And David came away and went back to the OMF headquarters and said to the area director, who was a different man then, um, he said, I realized what I should have done. He said, I should have gone to the top. And the area director, George Steed, said to him, Oh, I'm so glad you didn't do that, he said. That would have cost you twice as much. The higher the official, the greater the amount it will cost you to satisfy him. See? Now, in Indonesia, that was taken perfectly for granted. You see? That was the normal way that things worked. Somebody told me one of the reasons that many international firms will not quote for jobs in these countries is simply because they cannot assess how much contracts are going to cost. Because there is this hidden element in it. While I was in Indonesia, the missionaries were discussing the difference between bribery and extortion. And what they eventually decided was you had to be willing to be a victim of extortion, but you would never, as a Christian, perpetrate a bribe. Now, it's a very interesting thing. You see, that's all taken for granted. Now, that happens in our society, as you know. But the interesting thing is, when it comes out, it shocks everybody. Now, the interesting thing in the development of godlessness in the Western world will be when that shocks nobody. See? And we accept that as part of life. Now, the significant thing is, you see, it begins at the level of personal godlessness. And that's uh, what Isaiah is speaking about from verse 5. He says, uh, the end of verse 4, they conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers. I think the word probably is not vipers because zoologists tell us that vipers don't lay eggs. But um, it probably therefore is another Hebrew word for a different uh, kind of serpent. But they, they hatch the eggs of vipers. The idea is that the result of them is poisonous. Whoever eats their eggs will die, and when one is broken, an adder is hatched. They're cobwebs that they weave. Do you notice they spin a spider's web? Now, you know what a spider's web is for? It's for catching and destroying. That's what it's for. And everything in this godlessness produces poison in society and catches people unawares just like a spider's web catches a fly. And it produces destruction. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil. Deeds and acts of violence are in their hands. Now, just listen to this, will you? Really interesting, this, especially if you've been watching something of the activity of terrorists 
not only in our own world in the Middle East, but if you've been watching that incident in Northern Ireland this very day, listen to this. Their deeds, halfway through verse 6, are evil deeds and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. Now there is the perfect description from the 8th century B.C. of 1991. The modern world in its godlessness is precisely like this. And it all begins with personal godlessness. See? But then, you notice in uh, verses 9 to 15, Isaiah turns to us and we. Because, of course, it's all very well to say they are like this. The trouble with them is that this is what's happening in the world today, and they are doing this, that, and the other. But it's a very different thing to say, this is what we are like. Now notice verse 19, so justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness for brightness. But we walk in deep shadows like the blind. We grope along the wall and so on. Now, he is saying, you see, it's as though Isaiah was sitting down amongst the people and saying, this is what we are like ourselves. We are not looking down from our lofty perch and saying the corrupt nation is like this. Very easy for us to rail upon the corruption of society and not to sit down amongst them and say, this is what we are like ourselves. And I wonder just how much the half-hearted, half-willed evangelical church of Jesus Christ in Britain is responsible for some of the godlessness in our land. Now that I think is worth thinking about, my Christian brothers and sisters. But notice what he is saying. We are like the blind, verse 9. We look for light, but all is darkness. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. We have no sight. We are like the dead, verse 10 at the end. We have no strength. At midday we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong we are like the dead. Now do you notice the third thing? Very interestingly, Isaiah's similes are amazing. I did tell you, did I, that Sinclair Ferguson said to me, one of the things he would have loved above all else is to hear Isaiah preach must have been a marvelous preacher, but look at his similes. Not only are we like the blind and like the dead without sight and without strength, we are like the bears and like the doves without satisfaction. Verse 11, we all growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. Now, if you've ever heard the growling of a bear, I once heard one in Canada in a zoo. But I have heard doves often enough. You may know we have a little house in St. Andrews and just across the road there is a very old dove cot. And in the morning you can hear these doves moaning, moaning. It's an extraordinary sound. Now Isaiah says society is like this. The sense of the dissatisfaction that godlessness brings, it is moaning and growling. 
We look for justice, verse 11, but find none, for deliverance, but it is far away. So there is this sense of frustration and restlessness that runs through society, and which society, more than ours, has experienced it. Now, from verse 12 to verse 15, he gives the reason for this condition. It is rebellion against God and dishonesty before him. Our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us. We acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, fomenting oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. Now from verse 15, halfway through the verse, to the end of the chapter, he turns to the fourth set of pronouns, him and his. First of all, you and yours, them and theirs, then we and ours, and verse 15 him and his. And here is the picture of the Lord himself intervening. Verse 15, halfway through, the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. Now, if this people are going to be delivered, therefore, and this is where the whole thing takes on a different tone. If this people are going to be delivered, then only the Lord can do it. He saw there was no one. He was appalled there was no one to intervene. So, verse 16, his own arm worked salvation for him. Why is salvation exclusively God's work? The answer is that man cannot restore sight to the blind, and man cannot resurrect the dead. And that's the real condition of men and women without God in their godlessness. They are dead. Paul says in Ephesians 2, you were dead dead in trespasses and sins. Now, nothing but the power of God can raise the dead. And so, he says, his own arm worked salvation for him. And that's why God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And this is why he now goes on to speak about the Messiah. And this is what he is going to talk to us about till the end of the chapter. His own arm worked salvation for him. His own righteousness sustained him. Now, here is an interesting thing that you will probably recollect uh, reading in Ephesians chapter 6 in that great passage about the armor of God for those who are going out to do battle with the wiles of the devil. Do you remember Paul says, put on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation amongst these other things? Now, many people have thought, ah, what brought that into the apostle's mind was that he was chained to a Roman soldier, and he looked at his armor and said, he's got a breastplate, he's got a helmet. This is the kind of thing that we need in our warfare against the devil. Well, I really don't think they're right, you know, because these very expressions were already well known to the Apostle Paul from Isaiah. And the armor in which the believer goes out to wage war against the wiles of the devil is the very armor in which the Messiah was clad as he went out to win the battle for our salvation, as it were. And the first thing that Isaiah tells us he does, he comes to seek vengeance and to bring wrath 
against the enemies of God. Halfway through verse 17, he put on the garments of vengeance, wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. Halfway through verse 18, he will repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes when the Messiah comes, therefore. He will bring judgment as well as salvation, wrath as well as mercy. But then in verse 20, the Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. Now we're right back full circle. What is the great call of God the Redeemer. When Jesus came preaching the gospel, he said, and it was his very first recorded word in Mark's gospel, repent. Now it is this moral repentance and turning to God which is the first word of the Redeemer. And God enters into covenant with us that he will be our Redeemer and Savior, bringing this first word to us, those who will repent of their sins, declares the Lord, the Redeemer will come to Zion. And he will enter into covenant with them and put his spirit within them. And my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from you or from your children or grandchildren from this time on and forever. May the Lord make us a people who know true moral repentance every day of our lives, that we may have the reconciled face of God and an open access to Him in our daily experience, because there is nothing society needs more than a company of people like that. Let's pray. Father, we bless you for your truth and for your word and for your prophet Isaiah. We pray that we may humbly learn from you and glory in him who is the redeemer of his people. Bless us this evening, we pray for the glory and praise of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.